As we continue to worship our God through the hearing and preaching of his word, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. God arranged for our preaching of Malachi to be in this passage for the Sunday before Christmas on an aspect of the coming of Christ, so that I thought it would be appropriate to follow God's timing and uh, continue on with Malachi for the Sunday before Christmas, before looking at two other passages for Christmas Eve and then next Sunday as well. But it's uh, wonderful how in God's providence he planned for it to be this passage, the Sunday before Christmas. So let's begin in verse 17. Verse 17, you have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, how have we wearied him? So once again, God's people are expressing a cynical attitude towards their Lord. And once again, Malachi confronts them and exposes them for their words. We saw this in chapter one, verse two, how have you loved us? They said there, and then chapter one, verse six, how have we despised your name? Chapter two, verse 14, yet you say, for what reason? For what reason is God not accepting our offerings? So God takes the words that his people mouth in this book very seriously, our words matter to God. In fact, the Lord Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 36, that our words matter eternally. For on the day of judgment, he says, people will give account to God for every careless word they have spoken. Every careless word muttered under our breath when no one is listening, when we excuse ourselves for our grumbling, griping, complaining, or things that we say that are Christian substitutes for swear words, every careless word that we speak will be held to account by God. And God is listening when no one else is. So what do they accuse God of this time? Well, they charge God with not demonstrating his justice by letting evildoers get away with what they're doing. Notice what they say. In that you say... Everyone who does evil is good in the eyes, in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. That is, it looks like God is fine with those who do wrong and those who do evil because he's allowing so much injust injustice against us and doesn't seem to care about it. He is not acting to make things right when we're taken advantage of when we're exploited, when we're treated like we are less than human, when we are used by others or possibly even abused by others, evildoers are roaming free on the earth and they're not getting what's coming to them. I saw the news this week that I think it was in this decade from 2010 to 2020, 20,000 Nigerian Christians have been slaughtered by Boko Haram terrorists in Nigeria. And I believe it was just 30 last Sunday. Now here, what they are expressing is not only a doubt about God's justice that they're struggling with, this is outright blasphemy. Because notice they're saying in verse 17 that God delights, seemingly delights in those who commit evil acts against others because they are not getting what's coming to them. So obviously God must approve of the wrong they're doing. Maybe he's even happy about it. It's just astonishing what they're saying. And also, where is the God of justice? So they had returned home from exile. They had rebuilt the temple, rebuilt the walls of the city. They had resettled the countryside and restarted their farms and villages. According to the promise of God. And then what happened? Absolutely nothing in their eyes. There was no king from David's line 
to rise up to reign and establish justice and righteousness in the land and even on the earth. They were still being oppressed by the Persian government, by pagans, by unbelievers, as we would say. Many of them, as we see later in the book, lived almost a hand-to-mouth existence in poverty and economic deprivation. Drought and pestilence ravaged their crops and harvests were small year after year, and there seemed to be nowhere to run to, no escape. They couldn't come to America. America didn't exist at the time. There was no end in sight because wicked men had all the political power and influence and they got away with whatever arbitrary self-serving laws that they wanted to enforce. We see that later in chapter three, verse 15. And what was the response of God's people to living under this injustice in their society? Well, instead of getting on their knees, face down before God in humility before him, to bring all of their burdens and all of their troubles to God in prayer. They got on their own soapboxes, as it were, to bring all their accusations against God to the ears of others around them by openly complaining about God and his ways. They think that God is to blame And they accuse him of being distant, even absent from their troubles. Why isn't God doing anything about our suffering at the hands of evil and unjust men? Where is he, by the way? Where is the God who is supposed to judge sin and give sinners what they deserve? Now, notice that this is not directed against a universal sense of fairness. This is directed against God himself. Where is the God of justice. Now, today, many people are not even asking that question, where is the God of justice? But simply, where is justice? Leaving God completely out of the picture. Now, they think that they have grown tired of waiting for God to come through for them, to do what he has promised, to deliver them from hardship, to raise up a king in David's line to bring justice to the earth. But notice in the first part of the verse, Malachi tells them that it's not they who've got tired of waiting for God. God has grown tired of their cynical attitude. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Quite simply, the Lord is fed up with their griping, with their accusations that call his character into question. Clearly here, God is not in the grievance industry, the victimhood industry that does nothing but nurse a vague sense of injustice against imagined oppressors, which only fosters more envy and coveting amongst people, more hatred between people, and more division in society. God is not in that. Here they are like kids badgering their parents with demands, with complaining. Why does he get to do that? Why can't I have that? Why is he allowed to do that and he does not not held to account? That is not fair. They always get away with doing that. And as a parent, we know when our kids do that, we get weary of it. It's tiresome. You get tired of hearing it. And in the same way, our griping against God and against God's ways in our lives can be tiresome to him. He gets, verse 17, weary of hearing it. And he can get, humanly speaking, fed up and not want to hear any more about it from us. And these accusations against God are spoken day after day in our culture. Even sometimes in the church, where was God when this was happening? If he is so good and so loving and so just, why does he allow this? Why is the world such a mess? And why do so many evil people, lying people, get away with so much? Why do they have such success in doing it? Maybe It's because God just doesn't care. Maybe it's because he's not powerful enough to do anything. Where is the God of justice? If we're honest, maybe sometimes those thoughts creep into our own mind and heart. 
And this is the constant human tendency. We need to realize the evil of the sin for what it is. The constant human tendency to think that we have the right to usurp God, to take his place on the throne of the universe, to sit there as judge and jury and bring in all the evidence of why God is failing to be who we think he should be and what he should do. That humanity puts God on trial when we are the ones on trial before God. We are the accused approaching the judge. God is not the accused, the one who is being judged by humanity. That we think that we see things accurately and we see things clearly and that God could use a little bit of our help in running the world. Now, how might we respond to this common charge against God? More importantly, what response, what answer does God give in chapter 3, verse 1 and following to their cynical question, where is the God of justice? Notice now in verse 1 of chapter 3, God not only expresses his weariness, his disgust with their accusation against him, their charge, their unjust charge, But he also stoops down graciously to answer their complaint. Now in chapter 3, verse 1, you're wondering where the God of justice is? You want him to come? Okay, he will come. But will you be prepared for his coming? Behold, I am going to send. Not first, I am going to come. But first, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. So clearly first, the Lord is not taking time off. The Lord is not on hiatus. The Lord is not absent. We might literally translate this, look now, I, even I, am sending. This conveys a sense of God is doing this in the imminent future. He is working to bring about what he has planned. This is close at hand, even though in God's timing, we know this is still 400 years away from Malachi. Behold, look, I, even I, am sending my messenger. The name, my messenger, is actually the word Malachi. The same name as Malachi. Malachi means my messenger my spokesman. So the one God would send as his messenger would be a prophet like Malachi, and his ministry would be similar to Malachi's, to prepare the people for the arrival of the Lord himself in the midst of his people. And he, he will clear the way, he will clear the road, the path before me. Because if the Lord showed up unannounced, the people would be caught off guard and spiritually unprepared. In ancient times, when a king was getting ready to leave his fortress or his palace, as it were, to go out into the countryside, into the land itself, and to visit his people, he would have a messenger go out ahead of him to let the people know of his coming. And the messenger would not only announce his soon arrival so that the people would do everything they needed to do to welcome their king, but it also meant that this messenger was charged with the job of making sure that the road that the king traveled on, the highway, as it were, was in good condition, that it was cleared of any obstacles, any rocky patches were cleared away, boulders moved, potholes filled up, and also to make sure that any other traffic that was going to be on the road at that time, on that day, was cleared off to the side of that path or diverted to another highway so that the king had a clear road, a clear passage, When he visited, it would be similar today if the president visited, say, southeast Wisconsin, if he flew into Milwaukee or like he did a month ago, visited Waukesha and he did so unannounced. And we would just look up if we happened to see it at the time and see there's Air Force One right there landing, coming unannounced. He didn't tell us he was coming. If he did, we would have been prepared and got things ready. It's the same here with King's in this analogy, in the ancient world. So this means when God is saying, I will send my messenger and he will clear the way before me, they need to be spiritually prepared for his arrival and move any obstacles of sin that are scattered along the road that need to be cleared away to make themselves ready 
to follow him on the way of where he would lead them. Now turn to Matthew chapter 11. Who is this messenger? This is the next book of the Bible, Matthew 11, verse 7. Who is this messenger who would make ready for the Lord a people prepared, as Luke 1, 17 says? This messenger who is going to remove the roadblocks of sin that would keep the nation from being prepared for the Lord's coming. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? That is a, a man who was shaken by the winds of the time to say whatever the people of the day wanted to hear to scratch their itching ears? Obviously, no. But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. And then he quotes Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. You, speaking to Jesus, who will prepare your way, the way of Christ, the road he would walk to redeem his people, who will prepare your way before you. And who is this? Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, the baptizer, if the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So Malachi said in chapter 3, verse 1, I, the Lord, am sending my messenger before who will clear the way before me, that is the Lord of Israel. So the one who sent John the Baptist ahead of him to prepare his way was the Lord of Israel, which means the one who came after John. If John is clearing off the obstacles, the roadblocks of sin, by calling the people to repent, who is the one walking on that highway, on that road to come to redeem his people? And according to Malachi 3.1, it's the Lord of Israel, Yahweh. And when Jesus says, I send my messenger before your face ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Why is it significant here that when Jesus quotes Malachi 3.1, he changes before me, the Lord, to before you. Speaking of Jesus, bringing that out. Because the Lord is making clear that the one John was preparing the way for, the Lord of Israel in Malachi, is him. If John was the Lord's messenger, then what does that say about Jesus, the one he was clearing the way for? He is the Lord of Israel who came to his people, Yahweh in human flesh. This is a clear reference and claim to his deity. He is identified with the Lord of Israel. The New Testament takes passages that speak of the Lord of Israel and applies them to Jesus. He is the one, the Lord, coming after John. And now, back in Malachi 3.1, God speaks of a second messenger. And the Lord whom you are seeking, he will come suddenly to his temple. Now notice here, God here is speaking of one who is also God because he is the Lord. And yet, this Lord is distinct from God himself. God is speaking and he speaks of another person as the Lord. So God is the one who is sending and yet also, God is the one who is being sent. The one who is coming is God, and yet he's also a distinct person from God himself. There is the Lord and one also called the Lord. He will come as the one who is in charge in his role as master, the Lord of his house, that is the temple. He will come suddenly to his temple. 
This is also another indication that the Lord that God speaks of here must be himself divine. Because the temple he is going to come to is his temple. Notice, only God can come to his temple. The temple was not Israel's. It did not belong to them. It belonged to God. He will come suddenly to his temple. Meaning that when he comes to the temple that belongs to them, sorry, that belongs to him, it will take them by surprise. They will be caught off guard, even with the preparation. And this implies that when the Lord came, he would find the same kind of hypocrisy that characterized worship of the temple in Malachi's day. And one of the most momentous occasions in the Gospels is when Jesus finally appears in the temple. And with his authority, his divine authority, he confronts those who were corrupting the worship there as the Lord confronts the priests in Malachi's day. And there, when he confronts that corrupt worship, he speaks of the temple as his own. Is it not written, my house, the Lord says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Next, when the NASB says, and the messenger, it's, I think it's best rendered literally, even the messenger, that is, this is the same person as the Lord whom you are seeking, even the messenger of the covenant. This messenger is a different messenger than the first, because he is coming to his temple, and he will purify the people, which is a divine Work. So he is clearly divine and he is called the messenger of the covenant because when he comes, he's going to carry with him as a messenger. He's bringing with him the covenant that will restore the relationship, the covenant relationship between God and his people that they have broken because of their sin and their unfaithfulness. He would come to his unfaithful wife and renew the marriage vows, as it were. And that's why John the baptizer speaks of himself as merely the friend of the bridegroom, preparing the way for the bridegroom, the divine husband of his people, who is coming to renew the marriage vows, to restore the one, the one flesh union, as it were, the spiritual union between God and his people. And he is also, he is called the messenger of the covenant because he will fulfill all the righteous requirements of the Mosaic Covenant that the Lord entered into with Israel at Sinai, and he will be the mediator of a new and better covenant, as Hebrews 9.15 says. He will betroth his people to himself. The, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, and I believe this delight here. It's the same word as chapter 2, verse 17, and this is, I think, sarcastic, divine sarcasm, since in chapter 2, verse 17, they were clearly not delighting in the Lord and his ways, and they were thinking the Lord delights in evil. The messenger of the covenant in whom you claim to delight, behold, look, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. So at the end of verse one, they're likely saying, This is wonderful. This is exactly what we've been asking for, what we've been longing for. Finally, he's going to come. It's about time. But now in verse two, we find out that their response to the news of his coming should not be an unqualified expression of delight. Amen. Yes, he is coming. It should also be an, oh my, yikes, he is coming. But who can endure the day of his coming? They thought that God's coming would mean he would vindicate them, that he would bless them. And it didn't matter the true spiritual condition and their heart for God or, or not. And they naively thought that when the Lord appears, there would be nothing for him to do but to judge the wicked, 
the pagans, the Gentiles. But when he comes, he will come to judge. He will come to deal with sin, either to purify sinners or, as we see, to punish them. And so verses two through five answer the question, in what way will the Lord be the messenger, the enforcer, the bringer of the covenant when he comes? First in verses two through four, by a purifying judgment. Then in verse five, by a, we might say, punitive judgment. Notice, they're asking for God to come and judge, chapter two, verse 17. And so Malachi, here in chapter three, verse two, he asks them the question, is that really what you want? Because are you ready for his coming? Because his coming will be a day when he shows how strongly he opposes all those who challenge him. And he will do so with such massive and heavenly power against all unforgiven sin whether open or in secret, and that all who have not bound to his authority within a split second of his arrival, they will come to the realization that I am not, I cannot hide or escape from his eyes any longer. I will not be able to survive this. Who can endure the day of his coming? So they're asking for God's justice. And so Malachi says, well, God's justice is coming against you too. And will you be able to handle it? Will you be able to stand up under his scrutiny? You think that you are innocent and right and that there is nothing that God would hold you accountable for, that you will be able to endure the searching eyes of God and the fearsome heat of his holiness and the full demands of his moral law. And the very people who accuse God of being unjust, who question why he doesn't bring justice on the earth, they don't realize that if they refuse to repent of their sin, they will get God's justice themselves when he comes again. And who can stand when he appears? Malachi is saying, when he arrives, no one will be able to stand on their own works, on their own moral life, on their own virtue, by patting themselves on the back. They won't be able to stand on their own self-righteousness. He is not clearly here in verse two. The Lord himself is not coming to congratulate humanity on a job well done. All who are relying on themselves for their standing to face God on the last day will fall down will be forced to bow when they notice, verse 2, when they see the king of glory appear. And make no mistake, Revelation 1 says, every eye, every eye of every person on earth will, will see him when he appears. There will be no hiding from his gaze. And as Malachi now says, no one will even survive that encounter unless they have first been purified of their sin, as we now hear. For he is like a refiner's fire. And this is why his coming will not be completely pleasant because when he comes, he will come to remove sin from his people. He clearly, answering your charge from chapter 2, verse 17, he clearly does not delight in evildoers. He burns it up. The Lord is coming to judge sin. Make no mistake, Malachi says. And his holy character is compared to fire in the heat of the intensity of his holiness, in the complete purity of his holiness demands both inside and out thoughts, desires, words, and actions. And also it is like fire in its fiery passion to consume all that is moral and evil, immoral and evil in his sight. 
like a flame that devours anything it touches. So this is how fiercely he deals with sin, that his appearing must have a purifying effect. Ancient goldsmiths, ancient smelters, to use the language here of verse 3, they started with a hunk of ore, a hunk of rock dug up from the earth, and they put it in a furnace. And then they began blowing the bellows of the furnace so that it reached an extremely high temperature. And then the dross, the impurities, rose to the top of that kettle, and they could be scraped off so that the pure metal, the gold and the silver, was the only thing that was left. It was refined and separated from the low-quality rock and metal. And God is saying here, that's what he is all about. God is like a metal worker, purging our impurities from us to make us holy as he is holy. And he did that by sending his sinless son, by sending his Holy Spirit. And he continues to do that by his loving, fatherly discipline of his people. And that is part of the demonstration of his justice, of his judgment against sin. And that's the work the Lord came to do, to judge sin and to remove it from us. As Matthew 1, 21 says, he came to save his people from their sins, not by consuming us, but by cleansing us like the fire of a metal refiner, a goldsmith, boiling off the gunk, the dross, the worthless stuff that is not helping us toward holiness or toward heaven, burning away the impurities that have no value for following him and for a life of godliness. And so Malachi is saying here, the only way that we as sinners can endure and stand before his holy presence is if he first burns away the impurities and the sin that we can't get rid of on our own. So are you thankful for God's purifying work in your heart to, to purge you from sin and to bring out a more refined and pure, obedient love to him, even if it means God turning up the heat and having us go through the fires of affliction It is better to go through the furnace and through those high temperatures than to still have impurities in us. And sometimes the heat has to be intense to burn off the worthless dross from what he wants to keep. And he does it in love. As the hymn says, when through fiery trials, thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. And also, he will do so like fullers, like launderers soap. Now, our English translations have sought to help us here by translating this as the word soap, but there is no soap as we think of in biblical times. The laundry detergent that washers, launderers, used was an alkaline salt or a soda powder that was used as a bleaching agent. And it was an intense process to wash dirty laundry and to get clean clothes in the ancient world because after washing it fully in water and salt, that dirty garment, and then kneading it, and then treading upon it, stomping on it, they would then lay it on the rocks to dry. And as it was drying, they would beat out all the stains and all the spots with wooden paddles. That's how you would get stains out in the ancient world. And that's how you would clean your clothes. It has to be complete thorough full washing that involves a lot of effort on the part of the launderer and that's like what the lord came to do to completely remove the stains and the spots of sin while at the same time not destroying the garment not destroying us but it is an intense process to get sin out of us it involved the lord's immense unfathomable work in order for him to give of himself, to sacrifice of himself, to do alone by himself the complete work 
of cleansing us of all of our sins, and he had no help from us. He is the one who did it completely himself. And no matter how deep the stains are, no matter how long they have been there, no matter how normal they may seem to us now, no matter how hard they seem to get out or how they almost seem a part of us, he has the strength to clean you and to make you pure and new like fuller's soap. And then in verses three and four, I'll just summarize these. He is the enforcer of the covenant by purifying those who have been violating it. He will sit as a smelter, a refiner and purifier of silver. Silver was harder to refine and purify than gold, which I think is conveying here that the Lord will do the hardest work of purification. And he will do so by his own sovereign authority and power. He will sit to, to do this, which also conveys in sitting to do this, he's going to sit down and take his time as long as he needs to, to clean his people of all their sin. He will do this refining work until the job is done and until the work is complete. He's not getting, kind of going to give up on you as people. What he began, he will complete at the day of Christ Jesus, even if it means sitting down for a long time to cleanse his people as he sits at the right hand of God in heaven. And he will purify the sons of Levi, the priests, and refine them like gold and silver. And without going into all the biblical reasoning for this and the biblical verses, we know from the New Testament that by his death, the Lord would create a people who themselves are priests, a royal priesthood, who would offer spiritual sacrifices to him. And I believe this is the ultimate fulfillment of these words. So that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. But I want to focus on this phrase for just a minute before we go on to verse five. Notice these are offerings given in righteousness. This is the same word for justice. Offerings given in justice, implying, if you remember back from chapter one, verses six through 14, implying that they're cheap offerings, giving God the leftovers, giving God was what was not costly and their careless, irreverent regard for God back then. What does this imply about what they had been giving God back in chapter one? This implies that their cheap and careless worship was an injustice against who? Against God. So what in God's eyes, as he purifies his people so that they offer him worship that is truly just and right in his sight, what is the most glaring injustice in this world, both among the people of God and in the world at large, in the eyes of God, the most glaring injustice is worship that is not worthy of who God is. Are we, as God's cleansed and holy people, are we bothered by that injustice? That God is not receiving from us as the world that he rightly created and owns. He is not receiving the worship. Christ is not receiving the glory, the honor, the reverence, the regard that every tongue that will confess and every knee will bow. He is not receiving right now the glory that is due his name from all the nations. That is the greatest injustice on this earth and almost no one thinks about it but God's plan is to cleanse his people consecrate them to him so that they bring to him the worship that is right and that is just according to the glory that he is worthy of they will bring offerings in righteousness and justice then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem God's people will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years so God takes the initiative to purify his people and to address the greatest injustice that has been committed 
so that when he draws near to them, he will not consume them. If verses two through four are, are about the purifying justice of God, verse five is about the, for lack of a better term, the punishing justice of God. At Christ's first coming, if I can put it this way, we rightly sing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Because this is a day of salvation when God's love for sinners is clearly proclaimed and seen in the gift of his son to be the savior of all those who turn from their sins and call upon his name to save them from the judgment to come. At his first coming, we sing joy to the world. But at his second coming, as we see here in verse 5, Without exaggeration, it will be woe to the world because I will draw near to you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, those who are unfaithful in their marriage vows and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien, the sojourner, and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. He will be, as he says there, the chief witness against sinners. What does that mean? It means that he is the one who observed that they committed these crimes, that he himself will be at his second coming, the prosecuting attorney, and the judge, and he will notice, he will carry out the sentence quickly. It will be swift, verse five. God is not going to be slow to judge that time. And he will do so not from far away. It will not be an impersonal, distant and detached judgment. It will be by him personally drawing it near, verse five. So they were discouraged at just how rampant was the wrong in their day in the society in which they were living. And we can be too. But we need to return to the truth, to the comfort of the truth that God has all things in his hands, that God will judge, that all will answer not to any human court, but to their creator, whether they promote, verse 5, sorcery, demonic spiritualism and false religion that leads people astray, whether they live in immorality, whether they publicly lie and commit perjury by swearing falsely, whether they, as we might put this in our own day, they oppress the wage earner by seeking to shut down businesses that people rely on for their livelihood or perpetuate and do nothing about the epidemic of fatherlessness in our day, the orphan there. And yet, it is all too easy for us to do what God's people in Malachi in his day did, to look out at all the evil in the world as they did in chapter two, verse 17, that we think that God should take care of, but just like them, we can neglect to look inside our own hearts and put a microscope on our own lives and to see the sin that we need to have purged from us if we are going to stand before the Lord on the day when he comes again, that we must not only take the world's sin seriously, we must take our own sin seriously, even more so than the faults of the world. So are we bothered by all the wrong and all the injustice in the world, Malachi would say to us first, above all, be bothered by your own sin. Grieve for that. Pray for that. Be bleached white and clean from that before you look at the speck that is in the eyes of others. So the question for us still today is this. Who, what human being, can endure the day of his second coming? And the answer, only those who have already been purified of their sin by the blood 
of the Lamb. And either we will be purified now in this day of salvation from our sins, or will be, we will be judged for those sins on the day when he comes again. As Hebrews 9 verse 26 says, He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So by God's help, by God's Holy Spirit within us, may we seek to work out our salvation, to work to be purified from every defilement of body and of spirit now so that we can be a useful instrument in the hands of our master here on earth. No matter how hard the road that we walk in serving him so that we do not spend our days that he gives us here with a resentful attitude towards our Lord, thinking he's a harsh master, but that we would be found faithful to him when he comes again on the final day. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, how I need this word to me today, to us today. We remember the promise of 1 John 3, that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone, all Christians, not a special class of Christians, but everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. May we purify ourselves from committing, as he says here in verse 5, from committing any kind of sin in our body, in our thoughts, in our desires. May we purify ourselves from telling lies, purify ourselves from selfishness, from using others for our own benefit. May we purify ourselves from the cowardice that refuses to speak up for what is true and what is right and to defend the vulnerable, the oppressed, the unborn in our day. May we fear you by fleeing far away from sin. May we not be at peace with the sins that you say in verse 5, you are going to judge. And may we not presume to think that we will be okay when Christ comes again to bring justice against them. Father, may we strive for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. May we take our holiness more seriously than any other matter in our lives, any other issue in this world, because you appeared, Lord Jesus, to take away sins. And so we, by your help, we resolve that all of the purity and cleanness which we can have, we will pursue. That all the holiness which can be reached, we will press on to obtain. That all the likeness to Christ, which it is possible in this world of sin and for us as saved sinners, may it certainly be in us and in our lives by the powerful working of your Holy Spirit. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.